All right, looks like we're live. Welcome everybody. I'm Marius Marty. Welcome to Live Valuation. Today we're going to be taking a look at ticker AMKR, Amcor Technologies. Give me half a moment to double check some of the stream settings, make sure everything is up and running correctly. Looks good. Okay, so Amcor Technologies. After doing some sifting through a couple different screens over the weekends, uh, and then looking through the ones that kind of came up at the top of the list, this uh, was the business model that looked the uh, most interesting uh, to do, so I decided I'd do it. Um, it might be the only one this week that's uh, a new company that we never covered before because I now, as of today, I know some other 10Ks are coming out, so for the rest of the week I'll probably be covering companies that I've done at least once before on the channel, um, either just because they're companies I find interesting, so I like to do, have them up to date with their 10Ks or they're because they're personal holdings of mine either way, uh, at least two up on the docket. But we're going to do this one today. Uh, they provide... Uh, some back-end packaging and testing uh, operations for semiconductor manufacturing. Uh, so kind of like a third-party company that works with uh, different OEMs uh, throughout the semiconductor space. Uh, I was sifting through their, their 10K looking at that. Uh, and as of last year, anyway, the last 10K, uh, their largest customer was I believe they said 13% from Apple um, but then beyond that uh, I, I believe it was the top 10 of their customers made up like 60% of the revenues and then they had like another 50 customers or something uh, so it, it's pretty diversified there's a little bit of some obviously some large uh, concentration but 13% is not bad and Apple's not a bad person to have a, as large of a chunk of with so it's pretty interesting uh, company uh, their their position as far as like where, where they're likely to be used because they're more like a third party packaging and testing facility so a lot of these OEMs have their own packaging and testing and this is sort of to fill the back end or the backlog of a lot of the, the company's uh, orders so they work with basically all the manufacturers and during a, a situation like this here I think that this actually creates a, a, a situation where this company assuming they can execute well um, it's basically their time to shine when there's so many so much uh, different delays in shipping and uh, all that that's been going on throughout the year assuming they are able to execute that allows them to be able to take up a decent amount of uh, of sales in regards to the the alternatives in this particular space because in this particular space you would think there wouldn't actually be a very um, highly qualitative business I would imagine it would be highly commoditized but like looking at their their historical statements and their balance sheets it, it definitely seems like they have built a decent amount of reputation within the space so they're you know on one hand the type of products that they supply are very cheap and uh, you think commoditized but I think there's a lot of trust that uh, gets built into these business relationships so the more you work with the large manufacturers the more that they're going to come to you when they're in, in these tough spots so as long as you can continue to execute, that uh, creates a good situation for for you. Uh, and then, you know, looking through the results that they've had for the, these three quarters of this year, it definitely seems like they have been able to execute in this tough environment. They've taken up market share relative to the other people who do t uh, testing uh, services as well as packaging uh, facilities. Uh, so that definitely has put them in a good position to grow throughout the rest of the 5G cycle, which is important because as you can see right here, 41% of their sales comes from communications, and then a decent amount of it is split amongst various other semiconductor uh, related industries, whether consumer, automotive, industrial, computing. Uh, so I did do the segmentation already and all the other prep stuff. Uh, it's a, mostly lim leaned into semiconductor equipment, but we did give them a little bit of a lean towards each of those specific subcategories that they listed. 
Either way, they end up with a relatively high uh, unlevered beta of 1.26. Sales to capital ratio also high of 1.44 and relatively high net margins of 16.34 for the industry as well. So it's like this is a semiconductor equipment industry in particular, the industry where you can see that there is a high expected sales to capital ratio, partially because of the most recent year's performance, um, as well as net margins. Uh, but as a result of that, there's high expected returns. That's basically what the high unlevered beta is. High expected returns or high volatility or high risk. You can kind of read it multiple ways. The point is, is it is expected to have a higher beta. So depending on their debt dynamics, we'll see where it actually ends up um, as a whole. And then they do have 47% of the revenues coming from the United States, uh, but they do have 55% of their uh, assets in South Korea. So as a result of that, we do end, and it's pretty widely split the rest of it throughout the rest of the world. So we end up with a uh, updated equity risk premium of 5.3 before all that. Uh, 1.1 billion dollars in debt, four years, weighted maturity, 3.77 percent interest weight weighted. And then the first year, uh, that does appear they had high sales capital ratio, but that was also 2020. So it could be just because of the supply issues that they were having a hard one. We'll see what the, the previous year said. A relatively high returns on invested capital and returns on equity. They did start paying a dividend in 2020 um, and their margins were only 9.5%. But with 1.66 sales and capital ratio, the balance of that is still pretty strong. Uh, and then I've made some projections as far as what I think about their industry and revenues uh, based off of some data I was finding from uh, Business Insights and Statista which we'll get into uh, after we do all the financial stuff because uh, I kind of want to listen to some more of their calls to get an idea further of uh, if some of the projections I've kind of put in place make sense. Uh, but that's basically where my baseline here is, is I've kind of come up with a, a potential reasonable projected number of, uh, in the range of $8.1 $1 billion for them five years out um, for the analyst expected number. And then I kind of put that into a baseline of negative eight percent to twenty percent uh, revenue coggers, but we'll actually see what their history and all that looks like. I might be totally overshooting the high end of things and then the low end of things here, and this might be an over or undershoot too. But uh, I, I will look. At, we'll see what how I feel about that after putting the financials in. It's a bit of a spitball, and there's some adjustments I can make after looking uh, at some more of the numbers that it has listed on this page, as well as the analyst uh, projections. So anyway, I'm going to play the. Balls now. Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Amcor Technology second quarter 2021 earnings conference call. My name is Diego, and I will be your conference facilitator today. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's remarks, we will conduct a question and answer session. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. I would now like to turn the call over to Jennifer Ju, Head of Investor Relations. Thank you, Ms. Ju. Please go ahead. Thank you, operator. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Amcor's second quarter 2021 earnings conference call. Joining me today are Heel Rutten, our Chief Executive Officer, and Megan Faust, our Chief Financial Officer. Our earnings press release was filed with the SEC this afternoon and is available on the Investor Relations page of our website, along with the presentation slides that accompany today's call. During this presentation, we will use non-GAAP financial measures, and you can find the reconciliation to the U.S. GAAP equivalents on our website. We will make forward-looking statements about our expectations for Amcor's future performance based on the environment as we currently see it. Of course, actual results could differ. Please refer to our press release and other SEC filings for information on risk factors, uncertainties, and exceptions that could cause actual results to differ materially from these expectations. Please note that the financial results discussed today are preliminary and final data will be included in our Form 10-Q. And now I would like to turn the call over to Heal. Thanks, Jennifer. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining the call today. Today I will review our second quarter performance and will provide the outlook for the third quarter. I will also make a few comments on dynamics in the markets and technologies that MCOR is well positioned for future growth. 
We delivered solid financial results in the second quarter with an all-time quarterly revenue record of $1.41 billion, above the high end of guidance and an increase of 20% year-on-year and 6% sequentially. Following a strong first quarter, continued momentum resulted in better-than-expected performance in all end markets, most notably communications and consumer, where we saw a sequential increase of 6% and 9% respectively. High factory utilization for our advanced technology portfolio and continued improvement in our mainstream business resulted in a record second quarter EPS of 51 cents. The 6% sequential growth in communications exceeded our expectations after a strong first quarter in this segment. Year on year, our communications business grew 28%, representing 40% of total quarterly revenue. For the full year of 2021, we expect continued growth in this business, driven by the strength in the smartphone market, particularly in 5G, with current industry forecast of over 500 million 5G-enabled smartphones to be built this year. MCOR has a leading position in the 5G RF domain, and over recent years, we have established a proven technology portfolio to address the advanced requirements needed to enable 5G. With our DSMBGA Advanced SIP platform, we have established the preferred advanced packaging solution for this demanding application. MCOR's industry-leading design rules, dual-sided molding technology, conformal shielding together with inline RF testing, deliver best-in-class integration levels in a high-volume, high-yield manufacturing process. We continue to develop technology and manufacturing scale to support our customers in this growing market segment. In the automotive and industrial market, we achieved another quarterly revenue record. Year-on-year -year growth of 33% underlines the recovery in this end market. Some supply chain constraints, especially in the wavelength substrate supply, dampened even further growth. We continue to see strength in the mainstream part of our automotive portfolio and have received several customer endorsements especially for the quality and delivery performance in our Philippines factories. In the advanced product part of our portfolio, we ran several new products in the automotive sensor domain. For radar sensors, we utilize wafer level fanout technology in our portable factory. Customers are rapidly adopting this technology due to the strict requirements of radar sensors. In addition to the growing sensor market, we also ran several new products targeting the automotive high-power domain, accelerated by the growth of the EV market. For the second half of the year, we anticipate the automotive supply chain will gradually improve, resulting in further growth. Beyond the second half, we believe the growth drivers in this market remain in place, and we expect that semiconductor content per car will further increase due to accelerated proliferation of driver assistance electronics and the electrification of more car models. Strength in the consumer market resulted in a better than expected sequential increase of 9%. We continue to diversify our product and customer portfolio in IoT wearables and ran several new products in the quarter. We expect this market will be an important driver of growth and our overall product and customer pipeline for advanced SIP solutions in this domain remains strong. In addition to the wearable market, we also experienced strength in traditional consumer products like gaming, display, and video devices, and we expect continued growth going forward. Revenue in the computing market set another quarterly record, with sequential growth of 6% and a year-on-year -year growth of 21%. We experienced solid performance in all computing applications and a further strengthening of our project pipeline. We are investing in technology and manufacturing scale to capitalize on opportunities across the computing domain, from personal computing to infrastructure and data centers. We see more opportunities in this market in emerging segments like AI and high-performance computing and in the changes brought by the ongoing diverticalization in this market. Finally, our test business grew 12% year-on-year in the second quarter, 
as we broaden the scope of our test services for 5G communications and the system level testing and expand our test attach rates. To prepare for the volume ramp in the second half of 2021, our manufacturing organization has expanded clean room space and capacity, most notably for advanced packaging in our factories in Korea. Also, we are encouraged by progress in the U.S. on investment policies to incentivize domestic semiconductor manufacturing. The MCOR team is exploring a possible factory location to align with the investments in the U.S. supply chain of other major semiconductor companies. During the quarter, we increased our CapEx target for the year to around $775 million, partially in anticipation of some initial investments in a new factory location. Other major investments in 2021 are planned for wave level and flip chip technology, SIP and test capacity, as well as facility expansions and specific investments to support our Industry 4.0 program. Now let me turn to our third quarter outlook. We expect significant growth with revenue of $1.7 billion at the midpoint of guidance. This would represent a sequential increase of 21% and a year-on-year -year increase of 26%. The ongoing short-term constraints in the supply chain of materials and equipment are expected to continue into the second half of 2021, and we are working closely with our suppliers and customers to help mitigate these risks. For full year 2021, we expect growth in all end markets, particularly communications, and we are well positioned to support the continued recovery in automotive. We remain confident in our strong market position and the overall demand environment and expect to outgrow the semiconductor market in 2021. Megan will now provide more detailed financial information. Thank you, Heal, and good afternoon, everyone. Today, I will review our second quarter results and then provide some comments about our third quarter outlook. Second quarter sales were better than expected, up 6% from the first quarter to an all-time quarterly record of $1.41 billion. All of our end markets experienced growth this quarter, and as Heal noted, Revenue in both automotive and industrial, as well as computing, were new quarterly records. Advanced products revenue grew 17% in the first half of 2021 over the same period last year and represent approximately 70% of our business. Our mainstream products revenue also improved, driven by the recovery in automotive and increased 20% in the first half of 2021 over the same period last year. Advanced SIP products grew double digits sequentially in Q2, primarily in support of the communications and consumer end markets. With strong growth in both advanced and mainstream products, gross margin grew 300 basis points over prior year Q2 to 19.4% and gross profit dollars of $273 million is a second quarter record. Material content increased 150 basis points sequentially, and costs in support of second half growth moderately constrained gross margin. Operating expenses for the quarter came in slightly lower than expected at $118 million, and operating income margin growth outpaced gross margin expansion, increasing 365 basis points year-on-year -year to 11%. Net income for the quarter was $126 million, resulting in record Q2 EPS of $0.51. Cents. Q2 EBITDA increased over 40% year-on-year to $295 million, and EBITDA margin was 21%. We ended the quarter with $885 million of cash and short-term investment and total liquidity of $1.3 billion. Our solid financial position provides flexibility to continue to invest in growth opportunities. Moving on to our third quarter outlook, we expect revenue to be between $1.65 billion and $1.75 billion. 
gross margin is expected to be between 18.5 and 20.5 percent. Consistent with historical seasonality, Q3 expectations include a significant increase in communications driven by advanced SIP products. We expect Q3 operating expenses of around $115 million. Our plans for controlling OPEX in a significant growth environment are expected to contribute to operating income margin expansion of around 150 basis points. We expect full-year effective tax rate to be reduced to around 15% due to discrete tax benefits recognized in the first half of 2021 and favorable foreign currency movement. Q3 net income is expected to be between $150 million and $200 million, resulting in EPS of $0.60 to $0.80. This would represent over 80% growth in EPS at the midpoint compared to the prior year quarter. We are increasing our planned capital expenditures to $775 million for the year to meet strong second half demand and for initial investments in a new factory location. Our target capital intensity remains in the low teens and we expect free cash flow for 2021 to exceed prior year free cash flow. With that, we will now open the call up for your questions. Operator. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we'll be conducting our question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star one on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate that your line is in the question queue. You may press the star key followed by the number two if you would like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star key. Once again, to ask a question, press star one. We'll pause for a moment to pull for questions. Thank you. And our first question comes from Haas Lu with Credit Suisse. Please state your question. Hi, hi. Um, this is Angela on behalf of Randy, and um, congratulations on a great work. So, um, if you could give a little more color on um, what what has rolled the strength of your third quarter, um, what, what will be driving the strength of your third quarter sales, and um, about like relative strength and weakness application and and your initial view for fourth state. Hi Angela, let's just clarify the question. There was a little bit of audio on our side, so I think your question is to add some color um, with respect to any supply constraints that we might be experiencing heading into the to the third quarter. Uh, to perhaps expand um, by application on those supply constraints, and then whether or not we have any comments as it relates to impact in the fourth quarter. Um, did I capture your question appropriately? Um, actually, my question is more so around this um, larger drivers of, of um, your performance. Okay, so end market end market drivers. Okay, Angela, um, Keel, would you like okay. to address the end market drivers? Yes, uh, Angela. Um, let's um, let's try to summarize that. I'm, uh, you know, the main catalyst for growth uh, is, is certainly in the third quarter. It's 5G communication, then IoT, uh, specifically IoT wearables generally automotive and in automotive we see strength in the driver assistance features uh, and also in the automotive power domain and then of course high performance computing in general but if you look specifically into q3 we see that the communication market is uh, is strong we, we expect growth both in the volume of smartphones uh, to be sold in the third quarter as well as uh, an increase in the number of 5G handsets to be sold. Uh, you know, comparing to last year, it is expected that this year 500 million 
smartphone 5G enabled handsets will be uh, uh, deployed into the market, which is a doubling compared to last year. And that drives a significant semiconductor in, uh, content where uh, uh, MCOR has uh, uh, a good position in the RF domain, but also in mo uh, multiple other uh, components in the uh, 5G smartphones. So, Angela, just to add to Gil's comments to give you some color, our 21% increase for Q3 at the midpoint, uh, our, you know, the last five years we've had about 15% increase. So that significant um, increase in Q3 we're expecting, as Gil mentioned, is led by communications. Typically, if you look back at our Q3 performance, you'd see around a 30% increase for communications. And we're expecting something around, you know, 40 percent uh, for the communications market. Any follow-up questions, Angela? Yeah, sure. Um, about your third, third Q uh, growth margin guidance, it's, uh, um, does that you, you briefly mentioned about um, some cost factoring and um, can you elaborate upon that? The mid 20% margin. Yeah, Angela, are you speaking specifically to the Q3 guide for gross margin or specific to the Q2 actuals? I just wanted to make sure I addressed the right question. Yeah, the, um, the three Q guide. Okay. Yeah, so our midpoint for the gross margin guide is flat sequentially, um, acknowledging revenue is expected to increase 21%. So as you know, gross margin can fluctuate based on utilization or product mix. So advanced SIP revenue is increasing significantly in Q3, as I mentioned, that is supporting the communications market and advanced SIP does have a higher material content, and so that's what impacts product mix. However, our gross profit dollars are projected to be up over $50 million, or 20%, and operating income margin is expected to expand around 150 basis points sequentially. EPS is also expected to be up around 20 cents, or 40%, to a record 70 cents. So overall, while the product mix can have an impact on gross margin percentage, advanced SIP is profitable, generating good results and cash flow. And um, Any? to follow up around your, yeah, uh, around your SIP pipeline, can, can you give an update of your SIP pipeline, the revenue expectation? for the full year, and um, do you see it growing, factoring, multi-sourcing on some of the consumer audio products? Uh, thanks, Angela. Let me try to answer that uh, question. I think, uh, you know, with respect to, to our SIP uh, pipeline, as we already mentioned earlier, uh, you know, we have a strong pipeline both in the communication segment uh, as well as in the consumer uh, segment. Um, for communication, we see uh, healthy growth in, in the third quarter. And of course, we don't guide for the, for the full year, but we expect that to extend in the fourth quarter uh, also. For uh, the consumer mind market, we are ramping up uh, uh, several new products uh, in the second quarter as well as in the, in the third quarter. And we see continued uh, strength there, uh, proliferating in multiple products as well as in, in, in multiple, multiple customers, customers uh, there. Um, so, uh, you know, going forward, we expect uh, SIP to be an important uh, uh, product, pa part of our product portfolio in MCOR, where it goes from, you know, starting with communication, it extends into the consumer market as well as in the automotive and uh, and to computing markets. Any and, further um, questions um, there? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, you on lead time. 
on, on lead times, are your lead time running normal for assembly and test? And um, how are your lead times now for getting additional equipment? Okay, um, Angela, you know, in, in the supply chain, uh, we, uh, Sorry, we are, are experiencing several challenges. You know, one is in the lead time of equipment. Uh, you know, new equipment we saw over the last six to eight months lead times actually doubling. But overall, we were able to uh, install the capacity that we required for our ramp in the third quarter. So although that lead times are extending, we don't see that as a bottleneck for, uh, for the second half of this year. And we uh, already in anticipation of these lead times, we in selective areas uh, ordering equipment for the following year. Now, if we look to uh, the lead time for our uh, manufacturing process, these lead times are not, uh, are not changed. We don't see an extension there. We start our manufacturing process when we have all the materials available, and then the, the, our manufacturing lead time is unchanged, and that holds both for assembly as well as, uh, as, well as uh, test. Of course, besides equipment, uh, we see more uh, challenges in the supply chain for uh, materials specifically, where we see uh, significant challenges for substrates uh, and lead frames uh, in different parts of the market. For the second and third quarter, we're able to, um, to work with our suppliers and customers to deliver on our forecast. However, we see a challenge to support further upsides. Oh, that's great. Um, and next, um, regarding uh, the industry pool billing data, so um, the, the, the billings are at a record high, and do you worry some investors? Um, so how, how do you see the industry respond, and um, do you have any concern on the reversal to oversupply? And do you negotiate with with your customers on uh, any agreements to guarantee volume and mitigate risk added capacity? Okay. Uh, thanks, Angela. Let's let me start with the second part of your question: is uh, the agreements that we have with our customers. Uh, you know, in the current market conditions, we see several agreements with our customers that go beyond. Our, uh, our regular uh, agreements that we have. And they range from prepayments to minimum loading agreements in uh, critical areas where we see significant increases and customers are willing to support these, uh, these changing commercial terms uh, and work with, with us. Um, then go back to your first part of the question uh, that was very much related to billings in the equipment industry. And this is indeed uh, you know, a very strong year for the uh, equipment industry. We, we see significant installation of new capacity in the course of this year. You know, the way that we look at this is, uh, is very much that uh, in 2020, we saw a significant moderation in the installed capacity due to the COVID situation. So uh, I see 2021, uh, a bit of a catch-up uh, year where there is uh, uh, higher investments. Uh, that will continue. Of course, the, the industry is expected to grow, but I see this year very much as a, as a, uh, as a catch-up year versus uh, a moderate 2020 investment year. Uh, when it comes to the lead times for critical equipment, you know, we're working with our suppliers there to, uh, to assure that we have a forecast for uh, 2022 in such a way that uh, our suppliers can, uh, can uh, preempt uh, the volumes that they need to build for us uh, next year. And uh, we are uh, confident that we are able to uh, also support our customers in the coming year. Does that answer your question, uh, Angela? Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. I feel like it was her first time and our next in. question comes from Art Winston with Pilot Advisors. Please state your question. Not that I should talk shit. I've never called in, but still. 
great quarter for, for shareholders. Uh, my first question, real, is um, would you anticipate, if you forget seasonality, that the 5G business will continue to grow f from this level, or would you anticipate it, it should flatten, uh, flatten out going forward? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, we see the transition from 4G uh, to 5G continue continue for the next two to three years. Um, this year is expected 500 million uh, handsets being built with 5G capability, which is about 40% of the total handset market. We expect that to grow in 2022 to something like 65 to 70%. And then the years after it will gradually move to... Uh, to a higher percentage. The overall smartphone market, if you take the, the, the overall volume, it, it grows uh, uh, mid single digits percentages uh, uh, this year. Um, and we expect, uh, let's say, a, a moderate growth going forward. We saw some of the critical markets, like for example, the India market holding back a bit in the second quarter, but we expect that uh, to, to recover going forward. So that's that's what we we see, you know, over the next two years, continued growth in 5G. We have a strong footprint there, and that is a strong growth driver uh, for MCOR going forward. Good. Um, in terms of capacity utilization, are we bumping up against full utilization any place like Korea or someplace where where, where it you know fully utilized? Well, we installed significant uh, incremental capacity uh, actually uh, in the second quarter to prepare for the third quarter REM. Um, you know, currently our lines are uh, are highly utilized. Um, you know, we see still some, some utilization improvement possibilities in our Japan factory, for example. But uh, generally in the third and fourth quarter, we are close to fully utilized. And we also expect this year um, to be close to fully utilized in the third and fourth quarter. Wow. Okay. Uh, have you picked out a location in the, in the United States? And if so, what do you think the whole project uh, will cost when you're finished up with it? Well, um, you know, we, we're, 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 uh, we're watching closely the activities in, in the U.S. Uh, with uh, establishing um, and um, a semiconductor manufacturing supply chain. Uh, of course, we are encouraged uh, to see the, uh, the, the passage of the chips uh, for American funding. Um, MCOR is uniquely p uh, positioned uh, to be an OSET uh, uh, in the U.S. We are uh, you know, a U.S.-based uh, company. We are headquartered in Tempe, Arizona. Of course, with respect to the U.S. cost structure, in, uh, as compared to uh, to the uh, the Asian cost structure, we are really currently working with federal, state, and uh, local jurisdictions to really understand the uh, the incentives that could become uh, available to build a, a competitive uh, supply chain in the U.S. I mean, currently we are we are actively uh, exploring and evaluating potential sites for a U.S. Uh, facility um, and to bring that up in line with other investments in the in the supply chain to be able to support uh, our customers in the U.S. But, but nothing has been signed so far? Uh, you have nothing a is... Uh, yes. Uh, no, but we're zooming in to a few possible locations and we expect uh, to finalize uh, this in the next... Uh, 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 face. Okay, my, my last question is on a couple of older conference calls you alluded to uh, going into sort of more high technology um, t testing and, and, and emphasizing testing going forward, but you're really not talking about very much. So is, is that is, is testing growth uh, in the courts for the future? Well, t test, uh, let me step back uh, here uh, to create a perspective. I think turnkey uh, services for MCOR is important, and turnkey basically includes uh, bumping, probing, assembly, and final test. So testing is an integral part of our, uh, of our offering, and we're investing significantly to expand our uh, test capability and, and capacity. Um, very specifically in the 5G domain, 
where 5G testing is uh, uh, a new technology area where we started to invest in about two years ago. And we are now have significant volume uh, capability in place in our Korea facility. Okay. Well, thanks, and thanks for the results as well. Okay. Appreciate that. Thank you. And at this time, I'm showing no further questions. I would like to turn the call back over to Heel for closing remarks. Thank <clears> you. <throat> okay. Thank you. Before closing the call, I would like to recap our key messages. For the second quarter of 2021, we delivered the all-time record revenue of $1.41 billion and reckoned second quarter EPS of 51 cents. For the third quarter, we expect robust year-on-year -year growth of 26% with revenue of $1.7 billion. Supply chain constraints are expected to continue in the second half of this year, with gradual recovery occurring through the first part of next year. We are working closely with our customers and suppliers to help mitigate risks from these ongoing constraints. The main catalysts for growth are 5G, IoT, automotive, and high-performance computing. And with MCOS position in these key markets, we expect to outgrow the semiconductor market in 2021. And last but not least, I would like to thank the global MCOS team for delivering another great quarter. Thank you for joining the call today. Thank you. All right, and I'll play some of the third quarter one, probably not all the way through because we'll probably finish before then, but I've actually already listened to Good this Good day, one. ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Amcor Technology third quarter 2021 earnings conference call. My name is Hillary, and I will be your conference facilitator today. At this time, but in a general sense, Amcor definitely did outgrow the semiconductor space in, in 2021, month, just like it looks like they have generally over the course of the, the, reminder, the year. I was uh, wondering, I would now like to turn overall, I mean, you can see right now, you can see, that, at least for these five years, Thank they did grow at a 12% cogger. Thank you, operator. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Amcor's third quarter 2021 earnings conference Not call. amazing margins, but sustainable. Joining me today are Heel Rutan, our Chief Executive Officer, and Megan Faust, our Chief Financial Officer. They do have a high sales capital ratio. Our earnings press release was filed with the SEC this afternoon and is available on the Investor Relations page of our website, along with the presentation slides that accompany today's call. During this presentation, we will use non-GAAP financial measures, and you can find the reconciliation to the U.S. GAAP equivalent on our website. We will make forward-looking statements about our expectations for Amcor's future performance based on the environment as we currently see it. Of course, actual results could differ. Please refer to our press release and other SEC filings for information on risk factors, uncertainties, and exceptions that could cause actual results to differ materially from these expectations. Well, Please note that the financial results discussed today are preliminary and final data will be included in our Form 10-Q. And now, I would like to turn the call over to Heal. Thanks, Jennifer. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining the call today. We delivered outstanding financial results in the third quarter with record revenue of $1.68 billion and record profitability. Strong execution High factory utilization and controlled spending resulted in record quarterly EPS of 74 cents. When combined with the strong first half results, we generated $1.74 of EPS in the first three quarters, doubling last year performance in the same period. Revenue was up 24% year on year, and 20% sequential growth comes on top of an excellent second quarter. Continued momentum drove record performance in all end markets, most notably in communications and consumer, where we saw sequential revenue increases of 28% and 22% respectively. Our communication business grew 24% year on year, representing 43% of total quarterly revenue. The main driver for growth here is the strength in the smartphone market, particularly in 5G with current industry forecast of nearly 500 million 5G-enabled smartphones to be built this year. 
We expect 5G to remain an important growth driver, and we continue to invest in technology and manufacturing scale to support our customers in these growing markets. In the automotive and industrial markets, we achieved another quarterly revenue record, with sequential growth of 9% and year-on-year growth of 42%. The growth underlines a strong recovery in this market, although supply chain constraints, especially in wafer and substrate supply, dampened further growth. The strong recovery of our automotive business is mainly due to significant ramps of new products in this domain, particularly supporting the rapid proliferation of ADAS functionality and the accelerated electrification of car models. MCOR is well positioned to support these innovations with a solid technology portfolio and an established automotive qualified manufacturing base. In ADAS, we are ramping the assembly of the latest generation processors using our advanced flip chip technology and the portfolio of radar and optical sensors using wafer level fan out technology. For electrical vehicles, we are enabling the assembly of high power silicon carbide devices in our Japan factories, utilizing unique wire bond and lead frame technology. Although we foresee some short-term and mid-term constraints in the automotive supply chain, we believe the long-term growth drivers in this market remain in place, resulting in the continued expansion of semiconductor content per car. Market forecasts show growth rates in the automotive market that exceed the average semiconductor industry growth. Strength in the consumer market resulted in a better than expected sequential increase of 22%. We continue to diversify our product and customer portfolio in IoT wearables, and we ramped several new products in the third quarter. We expect this market to be an important driver of growth, and our overall product and customer pipeline for advanced SIP solutions in this sector remains strong. Revenue in the computing market set another quarterly record, with sequential growth of 9% and year-on-year growth of 28%. Further upside was tempered by constraints in material supply, especially high-end substrate materials. During the quarter, we experienced solid performance in all computing applications and a further strengthening of our project pipeline. We continue to invest in technology and manufacturing scale to capitalize on opportunities in emerging segments like AI and high-performance computing. Finally, our test business grew 19% year-on-year in the third quarter to a record $225 million as we broadened the scope of our test services for 5G communications and system-level testing. Our manufacturing organization did an excellent job managing the steep production ramp in the third quarter, most notably for advanced packaging in our factories in Korea. During the quarter, we added capacity and ramped several new products while working through obstacles in the supply chain caused by COVID restrictions and supply constraints for material and equipment. We work closely with our suppliers and customers and managed to keep the impact limited although we experienced some revenue impact for our SIP business due to short supply of critical ICs. We expect the constraints in material and equipment supply to continue into next year. To mitigate risk, we have expanded agreements with several of our suppliers, as well as most of our top customers, to warrant the better supply assurance in future periods. In the U.S., we continue to monitor investment policies to incentivize domestic semiconductor manufacturing, and we are exploring a possible factory location to align with the U.S. investments of other major semiconductor companies. Our CapEx target for the year remains at $775 million, with major investments for wafer level and... I'm going to say that last statement was code for they're going to build a semiconductor plant in Arizona. I'm going to say that right now considering Intel and and TSMC are both building semiconductor facilities in Arizona, and this company in question happens to be incorporated in Tempe, Arizona. 
might have to visit the facility I am in Arizona myself. We expect double-digit percentage growth in all end markets, and we remain confident in our strong market position and the overall demand environment. Megan will now provide more detailed financial information. Thank you, Heal, and good afternoon, everyone. Amcor delivered strong financial results in Q3, setting new records for revenue, gross profit, operating income, EPS, and EBITDA. Third quarter revenue of $1.68 billion was up $274 million, or 20% from the second quarter. And as Heal noted, all of our end markets set new revenue records. During the quarter, we successfully navigated through several disruptions in the supply chain, specifically material constraints for wafers, substrates, and components. These disruptions primarily impacted the communications end market, where our growth was hindered, but still in line with historical seasonality. This was partially offset by upsides in our consumer advanced SIP portfolio for IoT wearable products. Revenue for advanced products grew 26% sequentially and represents around 70% of our business. This significant growth is driven by new product introductions, primarily in advanced SIP, supporting the communications and consumer end markets. Our revenue for mainstream products grew 4% sequentially and 27% year-on-year, principally due to recovery in the automotive market. With high levels of utilization, gross margin expanded 150 basis points year-on-year to 19.33%, and our gross profit of $325 million is an all-time record. Operating expenses for the quarter came in as expected at $113 million. Our focus on controlling OPEX during a period of significant growth contributed to record operating income of $211 million. Operating income margin expanded 160 basis points sequentially to 12.6%. Net income for the quarter was $181 million, resulting in an all-time record EPS of 74 cents. We generated record EBITDA of $358 million in Q3 and EBITDA margin was 21.3%. Shifting to the balance sheet, we ended the quarter with $790 million of cash and short-term investments and total liquidity of $1.2 billion. At September 30th, total debt was approximately $1 billion and our debt to EBITDA ratio is 0.8 times, well below our target of 1.5 times. With respect to our capital allocation policy, we will reinvest in the business, supporting technology and capability advancements in R&D, as well as capacity expansion for organic growth. This may be equipment as well as facilities expansion when needed. Target capital intensity in the low teens and efficient utilization enables profitable growth. We will continue to optimize our debt structure with respect to amount, cost, and duration. We have reduced our interest expense by over 20% or $11 million for the nine months ended September 30th compared to the same period in the prior year. We also have access to reserve liquidity for unforeseen events or opportunities. As it relates to strategic investments, we target technology enhancements adjacent to our core competencies and geographic diversification supporting our customers' supply chain needs, for example, in the U.S. or other locations that are developing a semiconductor supply chain. Returning capital to shareholders remains a priority, and we expect to grow the dividend over time. Our solid financial position provides flexibility to achieve these priorities. Moving on to our fourth quarter outlook, we expect continued strength in the market with revenue to be between $1.59 billion and $1.69 billion. 
Considering the midpoint of our Q4 guidance, 2021 revenue growth is estimated to be around 20% over prior year. Gross margin is expected to be similar to Q3, between 18 and 20.5%. 20 we expect to maintain operating expenses at around $115 million. We expect our full year effective tax rate to be around 15% due to discrete tax benefits and favorable foreign currency movements. Q4 net income is expected to be between $140 million and $190 million, resulting in EPS of $0.55 cents to $0.75. Cents. Our forecast for capital expenditures for the full year remains at $775 million for a capital intensity in the low teens. With that, we will now open the call up for your questions. Operator. Thank you. We will now be conducting a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star one on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star Ooh, two if you'd I like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. One moment, please, while we poll for questions. Our first question is from Randy Abrams of Credit Suisse. Please state your okay, yes, um, thank you, good evening. Um, yeah, uh, good job on the results, to especially factoring the supply constraints. Um, I, I wanted to ask on the fourth quarter guidance, uh, where at the midpoint it's a small revenue decline. Um, could you elaborate some years, I think it's flat plus or minus. Um, for fourth quarter, how much of that is a supply constraint uh, impacting sales uh, versus um, if you, I'm, I'm curious if you're also seeing any areas of push out uh, due to customers also facing some mismatch uh, shipping product. Uh, so if, if you could elaborate a bit on the um, sequential decline granted off a high base in third quarter. Hi Randy, this is Sergio. Let me uh, try to, uh, to give you a first uh, flavor of Q4 guidance. You know, um, the fourth quarter for MCOR generally is a little bit uh, up or down. It can be up uh, a few percent or down a few percent. Um, the guidance is currently 2% down. Um, mostly we see a correction in the communication market where we see still some constraints in components, uh, specifically also critical ICs. Um, I don't see a correction, um, as you mentioned, in the end market where, um, let's say, end customers are uh, correcting their build plans based on, uh, on uh, imbalance in the supply chain. So, to me, it's still a continuation of the third quarter with limited supply of specific ICs. Okay. And if you could elaborate on, on constraints. Uh, you talked about a, a couple in the remarks, but auto, uh, the constraints you're seeing, in it, and, whether, and, and if you could give a, a look at how you see the constraints evolving. So I think auto was one area, uh, high-end substrate was an area. And if you yeah. could elaborate more on the, the constraints in ICs, are these um, mostly small IC, like power management, uh, or is it a, across different ICs? Uh, so, yes, if you could elaborate a bit on constraint and how you see it uh, continuing uh, looking forward as we go into next year. Um, okay. Um, you know, the, the way that we um, see and experience constraints is slightly different in each market segment. If we take, for example, the automotive market, uh, we observe the constraints in the beginning of the year was mostly uh, wafer constraints. Later on in this year, Q3, Q4, and also into next year, we see constraints continuing, but then shifting more on the substrate side, uh, specifically the higher-end substrates in automotive applications like ADAS, which is generally designed in advanced silicon nodes. We uh, observe uh, constraints there. 
um, and the basis is the same for for the computing market. Now, on the communication market, however, we see multiple um, uh, different dynamics. Um, there we see uh, for our SIP business a continued shortage of specific uh, components or ICs. And as you already mentioned, these are ICs which are, um, let's say, smaller ICs generally designed in the uh, more mature nodes. Um, and that we, we see to con see uh, continue in the in the fourth quarter. Okay, I mean, if, if you could give an initial view, um, I mean you mentioned it's mostly supply side, not demand side. Is there an initial view? Um, well, I'm sure we'll get more detail in a few months, but for uh, first quarter, how it's looking? If it looks like um, factoring the the supply demand um, you could see um, above seasonal first quarter, and then how you're viewing next year in terms of um, the overall environment, if you're expecting good year, still supply constrained year, or, um, and I'm curious on the risk side, if you see any areas where inventory is building up, like components that are more available, uh, but needing to slow that down. Um, well, we, we don't guide for, for uh, let's say, the first uh, uh, quarter next year or even beyond that, Randy. But, uh, you know, on the, on the inventory and supply situation, you know, there, there is some uh, short-term inventory built up because of some of the components constraints, and that would, would result in some buildup of uh, inventory of other components. Although our view is that that's still a small effect in the overall supply chain. Uh, we also see end customers being less conservative on holding more inventory. So we expect that based on their risk management, overall inventory during the year will, will continue to increase. You know, on the supply side, um, you know, on the wafer supply side, I believe that there the constraint will, uh, will ease in the first half of the year. On the substrate supply side, it may take a little bit longer. I mean, significant investments are made for substrate supply, um, let's say capacity increases, uh, but that will, in my view, only come on stream towards the fourth quarter of next year. Um, so, in short, I mean, I don't see significant inventory build up, and some of these constraints will ease a little bit in the, in the second quarter and some of them will will continue till the fourth quarter next year. Okay, um, so thank you. And one one last question I'll ask um, for the, I'm curious the SIP business uh, driver, if it's, um, I think traditionally that consumer SIP was audio, if, if that's still a big driver, or um, if you could give a profile of the SIP, like how much now it looks like it's growing this year, and the profile, if you could talk a bit more about this pipeline uh, and how, how it looks for continuing to grow the um, SIP opportunities. Um, yeah, our SIP opportunity, you know, in the third quarter, we saw significant strength in, in SIP. Um, you know, on the communication side, it was uh, slightly uh, moderated uh, because of the supply uh, constraints that I mentioned before. On the consumer side, it was strong, um, although also there we see some constraint, but it, uh, we had significant strength on the consumer side. We believe that to continue. Uh, we see also a diversification on, uh, on the product side, both on the communication as well as on the consumer side. Um, you know, and SIP uh, more broadly is also entering uh, applications like, like automotive, where we have strength uh, specifically on uh, the digital, let's say, uh, dashboard side. Um, uh, so, you know, multiple applications, strong product pipeline, and in our view, it's a growth, growth engine going forward. Okay, actually, and I'll fit, like, maybe uh, one more just on the, the margin implication. Uh, if, if it looks like from a, a capacity perspective, you're running near full. Would would the gross margin now, kind of when you're operating at this this level, fairly high, uh, 19, 20 percent, is that viewed as kind of the the, the high point, or you could say like upcycle margin if business remains healthy, 
or is there room, like, if we have a good year, uh, for some further margin leverage? Uh, Randy, uh, I, I need to, to take, make it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can take that, Randy. Um, so with respect to gross margins being at, you know, 19, 20 percent, um, while we're operating at high utilization, we do have still some capacity, um, specifically in our Japan location. Um, so there is some upside there. And then the only other comment I would make is one of the other variables besides utilization that does impact gross margin percentage is product mix. Um, so with respect to that mix of products, that can have an impact on gross margin percentage where we would have could have some upside as well. Okay. All right, great. Thanks. Thanks, Megan Hill. Thank you. We'll just cut it there since I uh, literally just finished. No point hearing any further questions. All right. So I'm going to attach to that price. A lot of things to look at. So I feel pretty reinforced with a lot of my assumptions, having listened, listened to a little bit more of the calls uh, and the stuff they're talking about. Um, yeah, they've had elevated gross margins in the most recent year. It's even more elevated in the three quarters of 2021 that we've had. Um, likely to assume that that's going to come back down. Um, as a result, their reported net income margin is also really high. You can see like the five-year average prior to that. I'm going to use the five-year average because they seem to have benefited from the tax uh, switch over from 2018, 2017. So five-year average uh, prior to COVID, you can see was 3.64%. Uh, so obviously that price that we have in there is based off of pretty high uh, margins we have placed in here. Uh, pretty low uh, sales to capital. So we do kind of have to flip these things overall and see that their uh, sales to capital ratio for a five-year period prior to that was an average of 1.39. Um, so we use 1.39 perhaps as our baseline set of assumption um, maybe half that as the half that as the low, lower point. Um, you can perhaps double that as a higher level baseline. Just closing down. Go. Yeah. All right, fine. You can sit. Down. Yeah. Okay. Don't get tangled in my cord. Pay no attention to my fussy cat. Anyway. Um, so yeah, I'm putting it like that, it gets us a baseline of 1.4 is a midpoint, maybe 2.1 is a little bit high, and they've really had um, levels up to that point. You can assume that there probably would have, be large entrance to that, so maybe a little bit lower than that as uh, a little bit of a conservative baseline. You can also use a conservative baseline for the analyst number, or, or perhaps not, I don't know. I don't necessarily feel that way. Um, their debt to equity ratio is 20%. Um, so zero to 100 is probably, you know, pretty much that assumes a, a basis of 46 overall. Uh, let's maybe use 10% as a low point. They don't seem likely to extinguish their debt anytime soon. They're also not likely to increase it necessarily up to that level. Um, if we take implied um, market cap without effective, affecting for issuance, uh, maybe in the worst case scenario, their market cap gets cut in half. Market cap gets cut in half, debt to equity ratio changes to 40%. Um, if you're gonna hop back up here, aren't you? And if they doubled it from there, then that perhaps that gets them to 80%. Um, but that's a little bit high on the distributed basis, so maybe 60%. That gets us to 33% distributed. That's not over adjusting for this. Um, maybe they'll keep it in the same range. So that gets us to 32%. So we're assuming that they issue more debt they do have the ambition to grow a decent amount, so perhaps it's still a little bit it's a little bit high, but it's not unreasonable. So either way, okay, so our debt levels are probably in, in an appropriate range. Um, it's just a question about the margins, which we do have in tremendously high. So we do have to adjust for that. If we assume, like I said, in a worst case scenario, their business does become relatively commoditized, um, then it could be that they end up with extremely low margins. Um, 1% is maybe being too harsh on the high end. Uh, I mean, in the most recent year of 2020, they had 6.87% um, for their adjusted net margin. So perhaps it goes to 10% or 11% on the, the high end of things. 
gets us an adjusted six percent in the middle it's still kind of high because again we're using this year as the base and their their average was more like 4.89 percent so it really ought to be more in line with that five percent is probably a good assumption for the best case scenario so I don't know. This is probably a fair sort of assumptions to have for their margins, and obviously that completely obliterated their their value. Um, let's go down and check out everything else. Yeah. So the levered beta after adjusting for debt and taxes, which I mean we can double check on that as well. Factor tax rate sixteen percent. It's pretty stable. Um, you could argue that it should be a little bit higher, which would actually benefit them because that's what this tax rate's about. It's not really a, we adjust tax rates and margins independently. They, we should, they should have to make sense with each other. Um, and then the debt ratio. I mean, high, having the high interest um, and having the high uh, higher tax rate that actually benefits them overall. could say that the sales to capital ratio is the part that's more sustainable than the than the higher margins so perhaps we shouldn't uh, be punishing them so harshly in that regard Let's see. Just more of a five year average. In terms of invested capital, five year average is about 11%. Yeah, I don't know. It just seems hard to believe that the the almost 7% net adjusted margin that they had last year is likely to sustain into the into the future uh, permanently. I mean, they did have pretty good margins this year, but I think it's still not really more than 6 or 7%. I don't know what it is on the adjusted net margin thing. I'd have to amortize the R&D to find out. Um, but I do know that the, the normal margin is not more than like 6% or something. Uh, so the adjusted net margin is not likely to be more than seven, eight percent at the most. And even if they had seven or eight percent in the, this particular twenty twenty one year, that still doesn't make their averages over the long run that high. And it's like, are they really going to like sustain the high margins and the high sales to capital ratio? See, that's the part that like, where I'm saying it's like, yeah, well, maybe they'll sustain the high sales to capital ratio, but they're not likely to sustain the high margins as well. It's like pick and choose. Um, maybe I mean again as I did say at the start they have a high sales to capital ratio and high net margins as an industry expectation it just comes with a high beta and sure enough they do have the high beta so it's possible that as they as they develop that's could be the course for it but so maybe, maybe I'm being a little too harsh maybe we can bring up the, the lower point and keep it more solidly at 5 I guess, and then we can maybe push the analyst number up. This is an expected income of 265 in this particular year and 400 in the, in the five year forward year. Maybe let's go take a, the income in the nine months has been 426 versus 211 so it's already been double that and that's in the nine months so yeah i mean okay maybe there are the margins in 2021 have been better than i was expecting uh i thought i, I thought i had already checked on that but maybe 
I was looking at the wrong year, but. What is that margin? Hold on. Okay, so actually it's been 9.66% in those nine months specifically, just the nine months, not a full year. Um, and then they were talking about the lowered seasonality in Q4, so it's probably gonna be a little bit lower than that. Uh, it's tricky because they're unlikely to sustain that that marginality as as the everything cools back off. That's the tricky part. So that's why it's like I guess I guess I should push it a little bit higher. But that does explain why people are um, valuing it so high um, in the current environment. I mean, if we use the five-year average, including 2020, then yeah, it's about 5.68 percent. Analysts are projecting relatively high EPS growth for them over the next five years. And the revenue that they're expecting for 2021 is 6.6 .6 billion and 6.45 billion. Uh, which I know that my, my revenue expectations are relatively in line um, with that. That's partially how I came up with this baseline. Thinking about the analysts as well as, like I said, projections based off of the semiconductor industry and parts of the semiconductor industry that they're in. It's just the margins part that gets it, makes it a little bit trickier. Um, it's like I don't really feel comfortable assuming they're going to have an eight to nine percent margin moving forward but i guess that's probably what the market is assuming like oh well they had it in this year so they must be likely to continue having it even though for all the time prior to covid they never had a margin higher than 8.35 percent and that was in a year where a bunch of special things were happening so All right, that's about as as much as I can I can accept. It's already grinding my gears and just like lack of uh, understanding about how to think about it. But six point five eight, it's still lower than the twenty twenty margin, which is much lower than twenty twenty one margin. But it at least presumes that that gets carried forward. Um, that gets us to three hundred million in, in the in the current year. Which I mean, again, we're, we're we already know it's going to be higher than that. But it's all about where it's going to be in this four year. It doesn't really matter so much about these four years. Um, but assuming that the net income is going to also continue to increase past that because i'm just looking at the, the overall history it's like yeah in the next several years uh with 5g there the market is likely to rev up further but i don't know how much you can necessarily rely on that um maybe maybe this is the the part where i'm being also a little unfair is the the lower base in over here because i do feel more confident in in holding the the higher um uh, sales cogger in general but the lower facing was perhaps unfair right, I think that's perhaps most I feel fair about their in, imputed returns on invested capital distributed comes out to about the same as it's been for the last five years. So that makes me also feel more comfortable. It's like I can't be making too wide of a crazy assumption if if it's puts them in line with the returns that they've already been generating. So there is that.
So let's adjust for default risk and we can call it there. I'll just definitely admit this is one where I, I, my knowledge on the market is limited. I was able to do some, some basic research on revenues related to the market, but thinking about margins related to it is definitely an area where I have to make a little bit of a crap shoot uh, bet. And so, yeah, obviously the market definitely seems to think that there's either going to be way higher revenues or way higher margins. And, or they're also just using way lower discount rates. That's also a potential part of it too. Because like I said, I have I come up with a pretty high beta for them just based off the industry. So it, it's it's some combination of that, that uh, the market either is assuming there's way less risk um, than or opportunity costs relative to what I'm seeing, um, or they're seeing way higher margins. Um, slash higher revenues, but I'm projecting pretty high revenues. So I don't think that that's necessarily the issue. I think it's more about the margins. I think my revenues are pretty all right. Okay, so pretty low default risk overall. All right, so that'll do it for us there. Ticker AMKR, Amcor Technologies. Uh, the US Treasury today is selling for 1.58%. Equity risk premium is 4.65% for mature markets. Uh, discount rate we come up with for this company based off of idiosyncratic and specific company risk is 9.35%, which again, as I was just saying, is kind of relatively high, uh, especially considering they're not a high debt company uh, and stuff. So it is, is that's one factor to take into account is why the value that I'm coming up with is what it is. You know, people can disagree philosophically on discount rates and uh, how to use and apply them. The dividend that they currently have is 0.68%. It's already the most recent year, but they're committed to growing it over time. Yeah, I keep burping. Excuse me on that one. Um, actually, hold on one second. I didn't just realize I never did adjust probabilities, and I probably could. Um, considering what I was doing with the margins, it doesn't really make me want to that much. <laughs> but I suppose I will lean a little bit more solidly into this because of my expectations about the margins or, or about the revenues I mean it pushes up the margins a little bit but I guess I'm okay with that anyway so back where I was where I was uh, sales five years ago were 2.8 billion dollars 2.9 billion dollars or so in the most recent year it was about five billion dollars and that gave them sales growth of 11.85 percent for the last five years their sales to capital ratio for the last uh, three or five year average, I believe that might have been, is 1.44, which is actually puts them perfectly in line with their industrial expectations. Uh, on that capital, they have returns about 11% or so for the last five years, and they have a debt to equity ratio currently of about 20 to 21%. Their default risk in the most recent year was negligible, around 0.85%, and they have a, a R&D adjusted profit margin of 5.68%, which is pretty low against their industrial expectations of 16.34%. They have profit in the most recent year of $347 million, and they're currently selling for $23.39. Uh, the probability distribution I'm using for them is relatively normal. Uh, like I just showed, I actually took about 5% out of the lower, um, uh, the lower outcome and pushed it more into the middle. So it is a little bit more leaning towards the middle, which pushed it technically towards the positive end of things. Either way, we have sales expectations of anywhere from $3.9 billion in the worst case scenario, to possibly $12.5 billion in the best case scenario. Uh, an expected base is 7.6 billion, which gives them uh, expectations of about 8.19% per year for the next five years in sales growth. And we're assuming their sales to capital ratio will stay in the same range of about 1.45 and that gives them returns of invested capital of about 11.86 percent so slightly higher than their current level uh, we do think they very well might issue more debt to achieve this coming to a distributed basis of about 28 uh, percent we see uh, default risk rising for them a little bit to 0.97 percent per year which is still pretty negligible less than one percent uh, our profit margins that we are Assuming for them is 6.81%. Um, like as I said, this is the part of the valuation that I'm definitely the least confident in. Um, the market definitely seems to be thinking that there's way higher margins coming for this business, um, and I'm just not so sure about that. I do think they, they can gain quite a lot of revenues and probably sustain a good capital base, 
but I think their margins will stay compressed just because of where they are in the production cycle. But that's my take on my relatively short time looking at the company. Um, either way, I am seeing uh, distributed profits for them in the five year forward period, about $552 million, but really it's sort of a range of anywhere from 117 million to 1.2 billion. So pretty wide range, as I was just saying, I'm pr pretty not confident in that aspect of the valuation. Either way, that gets us to a current value, uh, expected value of $16.76, which makes them 28% overvalued compared to their current price. And I see five year forward value targets unadjusted for the dividends they'll pay out during the period of $8.48 as the worst case scenario to possibly $59.71 as a best case scenario. On a distributed basis, I'm expecting about $26.20. Again, unadjusted for the dividends they pay out. And based off the price they're currently selling at, that gets us an implied return for the next five years of 2.3% per year, which is not very impressive at all. Um, so I, I like their business model, even though it's not really super high qualitative in the way that we've discussed about how you, having a combination of high sales of capital and a high profit margin uh, shows uh, qualitative factors showing up in quantitative factors. The, the industrial expectation seems to imply that they should have that, but they don't really have that. But I do like their place in the business cycle itself as a B2B player, um, as a back-end player, for a lot of OEMs, so it's like I actually like like where they are economically in in their structure, like like in the in the overall sales structure where their their business model is placed. So it's a very intriguing business to me for that reason, um, but it is very over overvalued. Maybe that's a result of being uh, included in so many semiconductor indexes. I don't know, uh, but like I said, it, it's just just overvalued probably because of disagreements between my margins and the markets or maybe like i said maybe it's the more technical factors having to do with indexes and being things being bought up uh short-term pricing metrics are kind of meaningless for this one because we don't have the analyst expectation number going into the model correctly for that so if this isn't really meaning meaningful it might it might reflect a more positive value if i was able to uh, put that in there correctly uh but there's a, a piece of the formula missing. I know they had like high percentage of there, so if we just like put that in there, yeah, see, suddenly that makes that work so much better. But yeah, so I come up with a pretty low value score because of the, the low margins uh, and the very low absolute value as a whole. So definitely not a very intriguing buy for me, but I will perhaps keep an eye on the company regardless uh, moving forward. Uh, so that's gonna do it for us today. Uh, like I said, there are, are multiple companies whose 10Ks are coming out literally today. So uh, they're, they're of interest to me. So that makes uh, the choices for Wednesday and Friday's uh, streams a little bit more easier to select. I'm almost certainly going to be looking at either Skyworks Solutions or Tyson Foods on Wednesday. Um, and very likely, whichever one I don't do on that day, I will do on Friday. Uh, one I own and the other one I don't, but both of which are very interesting companies to me. Uh, so I will certainly be doing that. Uh, I will catch you all again on Wednesday. We stream three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, usually around the time the market closes. Uh, so I will see you all next time.